short story by Paul McCann. A Troubled Runaway. It was the summer of 69 and all around the houses burned. The illegal paramilitaries were armed and placed snipers who perched themselves on rooftops. One by one they picked off innocent targets on the street. In Belfast we learned to zigzag when we ran and to help those who were hit. I stood there with many others and watched the senseless destruction of hundreds of houses in my village. But what a difference the day makes, because the very next day a promise was made to rebuild the houses and give them back at no cost to a community who had seen enough of the violence at their door. A great sense of pride returned to the district as three streets of new homes were rebuilt. It was a genuine love behind every brick that was laid. There was a heartfelt generosity from all sectors of the community. Businessmen donated building products and people offered their skills free of charge. After six years, the homes were finished, but not the troubles. After many assassinations in our district, the local people were forced to take matters into their own hands. They formed a group of vigilantes to protect the people of the district. One of these men was Jaggi. I got to know Jackie well over the years and respected his efforts over appealing for peace and calm between the British Army, who were seen as the invaders, and the community of Ardoin in North Belfast. I laughed the day that Jackie jumped up and he sat on top of the armoured car screaming out to the people for peace. Jackie ended up standing on top of the vehicle and echoing his opinions about the injustice of war Before long, he had a crowd gathering round. Most of the audience were women and children who cheered every time Jackie finished talking. The British Army saw no problem with Jackie's antics and slowly drove along the Crumlin Road with Jackie on the roof of their armoured car. People marched behind the armoured car and it was all harmless fun. It was like watching a movie that suddenly slowed down when it all happened. Out of nowhere, a car pulled up in front of the armoured car and this man got out and fired off arcs of bullets from his submachine gun into the small streets where I lived. Jackie was hit and fell to the ground and people died for cover as the British Army returned fire. So it was on that evening in March when Jackie had been shot dead that the picture turned very ugly. Gang leaders emerged and run territories around the province. Armed thugs and villains roamed the streets, applying force as they saw it. On the other hand, Jackie's death spurred on a new fight for law and order. The civil rights movement had been formed. At last, people spoke of an equality. No one was in minority, and no longer would anyone be manipulated and trodden underfoot. No longer would people turn away in fear. No one really expected the uneasy peace to last, but it did for a moment in time until a new situation erupted. The IRA began their offensive against the British Army. In 1969, as internment was introduced, the IRA went on an all-out fight to the end. For some, it was their last stand. Death or freedom was the cry as the gun battle in our tiny streets never let up. The British Army kicked in front doors and dragged out all men and boys over 16 years of age. Everyone was deemed a suspect. All suspects were to be put into internment camps and prisons without a fair trial. Many of those large families were then left without a father, husband, brother or son. Those members who were left behind felt bitter and cheated by those who had been sent to keep the peace. No longer could they trust England and the occupation of their army. The troubles escalated from that day with daily rioting and looting. Young men grew up and took up a gun as their fathers spent their days in internment camps and prison. Locked behind the barbed wires of Long Cash internment camp and other hastily built internment camps, an entire generation of men were locked up without trial and had to accept the law that had put them in there. On the outside, a new breed of freedom fighters emerged, ruthless and relentless in their cause to push England out of Ireland. 
There was car bombs and kidnapping, killing and confusion with new electronic warfare. Double agents and supergrasses were employed on all sides of the divide. It was serious stuff in it. Tit-for-tat assassinations soon began as names and secrets were being passed around the various paramilitary groups in Northern Ireland. No one felt safe answering a knock on their door, and when anyone left their front door each day, it was never sure enough if you'd return that evening. Then a rent strike had become living existence with gas meter strikes in the Catholic districts of North Belfast. Anti-social behaviour had crept into every corner of the city. Every community had to have its own police force. The underground paramilitaries kept things under control with kneecapping jobs and tarring and feathering, punishment shootings. A new breed with a new culture emerged from the rubbles of a city street being blown apart and they had a new blend of music and a new batch of songs. They had an attitude, they had grudges and found a hardness that not many had known or experienced before. All around the little streets, barricades and grenades fell among the people who stood there and watched on helplessly. There was no work because there was no industries. There was no peace, there was no hope left. As hard times brought a gritty substance into the expression, give us this day our daily bread. The church seats were not as popular as they once were, and many hard questions were being asked. Families began to hurt deeply, and a hunger for justice cried aloud. God seemed absent there, and grief filled every household in the district. Hard times indeed. More and more factories were burned to the ground, as were many small businesses, and soon the intimidations began. It was dangerous to travel and even more dangerous to talk about peace. Those who did find claims on their life. Somehow, my family and I found an escape hatch. Dad applied in desperation for emigration to Australia. And it all happened so quickly. We'd been accepted for emigration and were given two weeks to prepare to leave Belfast and to enter Australia. A new life in a new country awaited, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to go. I was devastated. To leave behind everything that meant anything to me in my life. The last week was hectic. Saying farewell to my friends was difficult. Everyone told me how lucky I was to get away out of Northern Ireland. I wish I could have taken them with me, though. On my last night in Belfast, I took a long walk home. Down along Etna Drive, and... What a shock I got when a sniper from the end of the street opened up with a semi-automatic weapon. I hit the deck and couldn't hardly move because the bullets were skimming past my ears. Some women came running out of their front door and they shouted over, Are you all right? What could I say? The gunman stopped to reload his weapon and I made a dash over the nearest garden wall and dived over into the safety behind a thick hedge. As morning came, I got up with only one thought for the day. This is my very last day at home. And it struck like a dagger in my heart. When the taxi pulled up at the house, all of our neighbours stood at their front doors waving goodbye. I took a last look at the black mountain, and as the gentle hue in the morning and the sun peered out over the rooftops, I felt no warmth in its kiss. When I arrived in Australia, I thought to myself... Is the war really over? The end.